So in our last video, we finished up talking about our adaptive immune system. Just a recap, we break up our immune system due to innate immune system and the adaptive, right? An adaptive out of your T and your B cells, and we just talked about that in our previous video. Let's talk about our innate immune system. These cells are gonna be your neutrophils, your macrophages, and your natural killer cells. And, like I said, the two things you need to really know for immunology is the cells and what they do. Here are the cells and what they do. And then proteins and cytokines that are released and what they do. There are proteins that are released and what they do. Because these are really important. <clears throat> these help coordinate everything. They help tell the cells where to go, tell the cells what to do, and what cells are needed where. All right, so these are very important. So let's just start with the proteins first. Start with the proteins first. When there's any sort of bug coming in your innate, the immune system will activate and all these cells, neutrophils, macrophages, natural killer cells will release proteins and cytokines. So all these things will release proteins and cytokines. Kind of sound the alarm, say, okay, there's a pathogen here. Now your liver can also sense when there is uh, inflammation and will also make proteins. Because it's in the early, innate, immediate stage, we call these acute phase proteins. Acute phase proteins. Right. The most important one that I release will be complements. We'll talk about complements and what they do in a second. But it also releases a ton of other acute phase proteins. It'll release C-reactive protein. And this helps fix complements. Fix complements. and facilitates phagocytosis by your macrophages and anything that eats baddies, right? Amyloid can be made, amyloid A in particular, and this also facilitates phagocytosis. Anything that facilitates phagocytosis we call an opsonin. It covers and coats the bacteria, your macrophages see that and say, okay, that's definitely something bad, I'm gonna eat that for sure. All right, kind of like when we said your immunoglobulins cover the bacteria and your macrophages will see that and try to eat it. Another acute phase protein or reactant that is increased is ferritin and hepcidin. These transport and store iron. Store iron. And what it does is it sequesters iron away from bacteria. Bacteria needs iron too. So it sequesters and stores it away from bacteria. Bacteria can't reach it, so they kind of die out. Some things it decreases is going to be transferrin that transports pro, uh, iron. Again, if you decrease it, it sequesters iron. And albumin. Albumin is the most abundant protein that your liver makes. And because it wants to make these more preferentially, it'll stop making albumin. It conserves some of the amino acids, conserves some of the proteins so you can make some more important ones when it comes to inflammation. All right, so that's some of the things your liver makes, but the most important by far is gonna be your complement, your complement system. Let's talk about your complement system. It's actually called the complement cascade. Because what it does is it keeps going down and cleaving proteins. So it cleaves one protein and that protein cleaves another protein and that cleaves another and kind of cascades. So it's called the complement cascade. And so it'll cleave proteins and it'll make an alpha subunit. And this is a smaller subunit. And it leaves in the bloodstream and kind of, kind of sounds the alarm, sends a signal out into the bloodstream. Then you have the beta subunit, which stays on the pathogen. So your beta subunit jumps on the pathogen and says, he's over here, I got him, I got him. Stays on the pathogen and then the alpha subunit leaves. Leaves in your bloodstream, kind of sounds the alarm, all right? So you have your alpha and your beta subunit. Now there are multiple ways your complement system gets activated. If you remember in our previous video, we said if there's a pathogen with a little antigen here, aminoglobulins can attach this, and complements can bind here, right? And when complements bind, they get activated. We call this the classical pathway. It is activated by an immunoglobulin. Usually IgG, 
N I G M. Another pathway can <clears throat> another pathway that activates the complement cascade is your lecithin pathway. Your lecithin pathway. This is when complements bind to mannose, bacterial mannose. This is a sugar. It says, whoa, that's not normal. I'm going to activate my complement cascade. And then lastly is the alternative pathway, where it binds to some sort of microbe protein that's not normal, or it binds to a cell that doesn't have a complement inhibitor. Some cells have things that stop complement from binding to it, so it doesn't activate. But other cells, especially bacterial cells, might not have that. So complements can bind to it and activate via the alternative pathway. So many different pathways. Let's talk about the first one, the classical pathway. So you have, draw it back out. You have your pathogen with your antigen. And then your immunoglobulin will bind to it. And complement will bind to it also. And it will activate the classical pathway. Classical. Right. The complement that activates, the complement that binds it will be C1. And this forms the C1 complex. And when it forms that complex, C1 will break into C2A and C4B. And together, this makes an enzyme C3 convertase. And what that does is it converts C3 into C3A and C3B. Can you see why we call it a cascade now, right? It keeps breaking down these proteins. And this will break down C5 and turn it into C5A and C5B. And that will break down C6 and C7 and C8, C9, et cetera, et cetera. That's why we call it the complement cascade. That's why I call it the complement cascade. This is actually how the classical pathway works and is actually how the lecithin pathway works. So classical and lecithin. lecithin. Let's talk about the alternative pathway. Here, C3 will spontaneously become C3B, and this will be your C3 convertase. And what that does is, you already know what it does, cleaves C3 into C3A, C3B, and that cleaves C5 into C5A, C5B, etc., etc. Continues the cascade. So that's your alternative pathway. <clears throat> so you cleaved all these proteins. Now, what do these proteins actually do? It's probably the more important thing that you should know. Well, C3A and C5A are vasodilators. Vasodilators. You can have too much vasodilation, and especially in anaphylaxis, you can have swelling of your lips and your mouth and your throat. That's the very dangerous part. So, or anaphylaxis, it's not good. C5A also, in particular, chemotactically pulls in neutrophils. Didn't I say these proteins help coordinate cells, tell it where to go? Well, this one, coordinate cells, tells it where to go. Chemotactically pulls in neutrophils. C, C3B and 5B help Opsonize, so they're opsonins. Remember B, Bs stay on pathogens. So they stay on the pathogen, they're coated all over the pathogens, and like I said, anything that coats the pathogen, your macrophage sees that and says, I'm definitely supposed to eat that. Right, it's being attacked by all these things, I'm definitely supposed to eat that, it's an opsonin. Right, opsonins help macrophages. So we talked about some opsonins already, right? Complements are opsonin, immunoglobulins are opsonin, amyloid is an opsonin, CRP. So just keep those in mind. Those are all opsonins. And then lastly, you should know C5 to C9 makes MAC, which means membrane attack complex. What the heck is a membrane attack complex? It helps destroy pathogens. Let's say this is a bacterial cell. A bacterial cell. C5 will plug in. Six will plug in. Seven will plug in. Eight, nine. Kind of makes like a transmembrane receptor 
rips a hole right through the right through the membrane makes kind of like a receptor and things can pour through it the cell dies so that makes your mac if you're deficient in nine now if you're deficient in five to nine you don't make that mac you don't make that attack complex you can't destroy pathogens and the one bacteria that likes to pop up is Neisseria Neisseria so you can get Neisseria meningitis all that stuff Neisseria Neisseria has a very thin membrane and usually because it has a thin membrane you puncture some holes in it through the MAC complex you can kill Neisseria right away you can't puncture it if you're deficient in it then Neisseria will populate and you get Neisseria infection so deficiency equals Neisseria infections gotta know that so these are very important proteins in your immune system and they mediate inflammation all right they mediate inflammation now we can't just let them rev up forever right eventually we have to stop them we have to inhibit them so let's talk about inhibitors inhibitors kind of regulators right you can have c1 s race inhibitor if you recall if here's your body, here's your antigen and your immunoglobulin that binds to it, complement C1 binds here, and this forms a C1 complex. And that activates the whole cascade for your classical and your lecithin pathway. Well, C1 S race inhibitor won't block that. You block that, you don't get the whole cascade, you don't get complement, you stop complement. All right, so I'll say blocks C1 complex. Also blocks other inflammatory mediators like bradykinin. which is a vasodilator. Now, if you're deficient in C1S race inhibitor, or deficient, then you have unlimited complements, you have unlimited bradykinin, you have unlimited vasodilation. And the most important sign is dangerous angioedema, dangerous swelling due to that uncontrolled vasodilation. You can have swelling in the throat. That's the thing that usually kills people, All right? So dangerous swelling. You might remember that ACE breaks down bradykinin also. And if you block ACE with ACE inhibitors, don't you get angioedema of the lips? Don't you get swelling? Kind of the same idea here. The next inhibitor I want to talk about is CD55, DK accelerator factor or accelerating factor. Like I said, some cells have things that block complement. Block complement. All right, CD55 is one that interferes with complements and stops complement. That way you stop the complement cascade. That's why it's one of the inhibitors. Now what happens if you're deficient in it? What happens if you're deficient in it? What happens if you don't have CD55? Well, then you can't stop complement. Complements will bind to your own cells and destroy your own cells. The one you need to know is it likes to destroy your red blood cells and gives you something called PNH, which we talked about in our heme block where complements destroy your red blood cells and then you wake up in the morning and you actually pee out blood. Pee out blood. Right. So those are your inhibitors and that's what happens when you're deficient in them. When you're deficient in them. Now let's go back to your complements. We listed what they do. I just want to touch on this right here. C3A and C5A help vasodilate. How do they vasodilate? Well, they activate your mast cells. We already kind of talked about your mast cells. We talked about how IgE activates it. Well, now we have something else that activates it. Complements. Like C3A and C5A. And you know that your mast cells release histamine and that's a potent vasodilator. So now you know how it vasodilates. It also released something called arachnidonic acid. What the heck is arachnidonic acid? Well, in <coughs> the phospholipid <coughs> of all cells, you have arachnidonic acid and it stays there. However, if there's inflammation, then arachnidonic acid will leave. It's kind of like an emergency break glass. Well, your cells have a in case of inflammation, break glass and release arachnidonic acid. So when there's inflammation, when mast cells are activated, when complements are activated, then <clears throat> arachnidonic acid will be released via phospholipase A2. It will break down this phospholipid, that's why it's called phospholipase, break it down and release 
arachnidonic acid. And arachnidonic acid can get worked on by cyclooxygenase to make thromboxanes and prostaglandins. Can get worked on by lipooxygenase to make leukotrienes. An important leukotriene you should know is leukotriene B4, which is a chemotactic agent. It's another thing that pulls in cells. Pulls in cells. I just want to quickly talk about all the things that pull in cells, all the chemotactic agents, chemotaxis, that you need to know. C5A was one. We just talked about LTB4. Bacterial products, that just kind of makes sense. And something that makes bradykinin, we said that bradykinin, I kind of raised it, bradykinin was an inflammatory mediator called calocrean. And then lastly, IL-8, which is secreted by your cells. It kind of pull in your cells all together. So that's a perfect transition to our next video, our next talk. Like I said, in immunology, you need to know two things. You need to know proteins and what they do, and you need to know cells and what they do. And in our next video, we're going to talk about these cells. If you enjoyed this video, thanks.